Good morning, I'm Bryony Kimmings. Um, I'm going to show off to, just wanted to because you did. Um, uh, okay, I'm a multi-award winning performance artist, political activist and theatre maker based in Oxford, which is new, so welcome me in, and, and London. Um, I've been granted five star reviews from each of the major newspapers in the country. My last multi-platform theatre project reached over 22 million individuals in its lifetime. I've been on the radio and telly many times for my pursuits on Women's Hour, This Morning, Sky News. My next shows are commissioned by Complicite and the Royal Court. Now, believe it or not, blowing my own trumpet in public is actually not really my thing. I'm a much more airing my dirty laundry in public kind of girl. But I think it's very important to give an idea of context when I speak about the past 18 months for myself. Mm, I'm... I am what many people would consider to be an, a successful artist. Um, I, receive, I publicly, re, re, publicly receive a good level of venue support and funding for my work. And I know from the emails I receive that from, for some young artists and students, I'm busy living the dream. But in November 2013, I reached the end of my tether with art. I can remember where I was. I was in my freezing cold kitchen in Clapton, which is in Hackney in London, just off the aptly named Murder Mile, I used to live, sitting at the table having a coffee. I hadn't seen anyone for a week or so, isolating as life as a solo artist can be. And I was elbow deep in my finances for the coming financial year, trying to figure out how to make ends meet and also grow my business. Um, I needed to stop doing admin producing and being an artist at the same time. My art was suffering and I could see my quality dropping, which is an awful feeling as an artist, isn't it, when your quality starts to drop because you haven't got enough time. And I wanted to not have to rush to make another show because I wasn't ready to make one. I had spent the morning clanging my boiler with a wrench. The bolts used to move in the night and looking at a friend's new house on Facebook. I opened my email and I found a reply from a venue who I'd been in a rather annoying negotiation for some weeks as I tried to finalise the booking of my spring 2014 tour of Credible Likeable Superstar Role Model. The show toured with a small team of four, including a child of nine, um, and its shelf life and thus earning power was limited because of school for that nine-year-old and because of growing up and all that. The show toured at five grand a week for six shows. That's what they wanted, six shows. Um, it wasn't a pie in the sky price from La La Land. I'd figured it out um, and, and it had a discount from a touring grant that was not yet secured, but mid application. As usual, I was signing contracts um, with venues, not able to get tour funding secured until those contracts had been signed and therefore taking all the risk for myself. Um, they were offering me half, 2,500. They've been offering half since the negotiation began, but constantly dangling the carrot of potentially giving me the full fee. But they still, on this occasion, uh, there was still no move on the price. They simply didn't have the money, they said. I tweeted an off-the-cuff annoyance about it. Something about public funding of 2.5 million. Something about my bloody boiler. About the fact I just had to give it all up. Drama queen. <laughs> Get a proper job. And Lynn Gardner tweeted me back from The Guardian to tell me to write a blog about it. She said it would be refreshing to see that blog. And as we all know, when Lynn Gardner asks you to do something, you have to do it. <laughs> I was known for angry art blogs, but I didn't want it to be just another one of those. A few thousand readers, some retweets, some lols. The usual here, here, but no action. I'd been lucky enough to visit Cuba that year, and I was, uh, like, I was pocket <laughs> socialist going mad in my house. Um, as I wrote it, I had this steely determination that as an activist and as a person who was sometimes listened to, with a connection to lots of other artists, I run a, um, a solo artist group at the Soho Theatre with about 400 members, and I'm quite a social butterfly, I had to try and provoke some kind of change with what I said just sitting and moaning and rolling over the same old slogans and the same old blame and solution ideas was going to precisely get me nowhere. So I decided the best thing to do, having spoken to my mum on the phone about it, was to bear all. My mum always said honesty was the best policy and have I mentioned that I like to air my dirty laundry. So I decided to write down everything. Everything. How much I charged. How much I earned. 
what bills, what my bills were, what my dreams were, what my fears were, how I didn't have a pension, but I had loads of plastic awards on my wall. The things that hacked me off about venues and funders, the things that hacked me off even more about myself and artists. I talked about the things all artists talk about in whispers, the cliches, the public secrets. I talked till I was blue in the face. I knew it was a kind of suicide. But I felt so powerless in that moment in a structure that seemed to place the artist at the bottom of the food chain, when in fact they were the reason that the food chain existed in the first place, that I rebel when I feel powerless. I think it's my labour heart. Now, I wrote down my bugbears, which will annoy you. Um, I said, don't ask me to do stuff for free. I'm bored of it. I don't want to stay on people's floors when I tour. I don't need to. Don't assume that the Arts Council will subsidise my work, because I might need to use the Arts Council to subsidise something else, not your tour. Um, don't ask me to audience develop when I live 400 miles away. I don't know anybody in your area. And don't lie, and don't tell me I lie about costs, because I don't. I vomed it all up and asked other artists to be brave and do the same. I said I didn't, I said I feared that, I said I didn't think any of us were actually making it work that we were all hiding some kind of false economy, that everybody was subsidising their own work, breaking their backs for nothing, that this might be why so many of my favourite artists disappeared in their 30s, especially women, that, so many clambered, that why so many clambered for MPO status, even if it wasn't really logical to their practice. Um, and that, that if this was the case, could somebody tell me so I could stop breaking my back and pretending that I was doing it right when I was doing it so wrong? I was also pretty clear that I wasn't an idiot, I'd actually worked in business planning and development within venues and organisations for seven years before I'd become an artist and I knew how to do maths. The blog was called You Show Me Yours and it began what has now become known as the I'll Show You Mine debate. The response was insane. 160,000 individual readers read it in the first month. Over 100 artists shared their earnings with me via email. The average for those 100 artists was 13 grand a year. And those artists were all mid-career like me, not emerging artists. Arts admin collated 60 blog responses, but there were infinitely more and still continue to be. The press jumped on it and went a bit mental as well. I'll show you mine, the focus group began. A group of artists committed to action and change and to four meetings in one year. A hundred artists came to the first meeting, one cold night at Chisholm dance space. And as we all sat in a circle on the floor, I looked into each other's eyes and I knew we were all tired and all champing at the bit for change and I had a little cry. Mo movement started in America, Ireland, and just this week, a new one in Australia has begun, because I've been in Australia stirring it up. <laughs> Venues responded and got involved and we joined forces. Other art forms joined in. Visual art had already begun a movement thanks to the AN magazine and we teamed up together and did quite a lot of conferences together. I was asked to speak at so many conferences, all paid very handsomely, of course. Imagine trying to ask me to do something for free after that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and about four months in, <laughs> I'm getting paid, about four months in, the special elite I'll show you mine task force, which was a few of us artists that were super enthusiastic, were invited into the New Arts Council office, head office to discuss pay and living wage ahead of the new round of MPO contacts, contracts and a discussion began about real change and a new line was written into the agreements that the venues had to sign about fair pay. And I changed. I changed my daily fee. I was told I was charging half the amount I should be, which is amazing isn't it? I didn't know that. Um, I doubled it and no one blinked. Well, some people blink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not you, not you, not you. Um, I shared my funding budgets with other people. I took the plunge and took on staff to speculate to accumulate, which worked out very nicely. I spoke honestly for the first time in a funding meeting about maternity leave, and it was welcomed. Um, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to do and why I no long, what, I, what I no longer wanted to do and what would increase my earning capacity from solo artist to company limited. I thought bigger and I found my second wind. But most importantly, I think what happened during this 18 months was, a very, that, was, was that very different parts of a sector, so tight-knit but also and often so self-consumed, began to truly understand what the other one had to go through on a daily basis. That every link in the chain and every offer made, accepted and countered had an effect on every other part of this intricate network.
Nothing was operating individually, but rather perpetuating a culture and that every party, artist, venue, funder, had as much responsibility as the other in changing that culture. Having worked in the arts for 15 years now, I, as I'm sure we all do, hear the same old cries for the same old things, like you've said. Giant sweeping statements for solutions. The same bugbears and complaints repeat and repeat. The same things are promised in a new language. The prosperous creative industries speak of the Labour government for me, bred a whole, a whole new type of artist and arts worker who expected a lot, but would fight for nothing much. With the I'll Show You Mind debate, the um, solutions proved, especially to us artists themselves, to not be simple or forthcoming or all-encompassing, but rather they proved themselves to be distinctly holistic and human. Now, I hate the word holistic, but I mean it. Holistic and human. It came down to behavioural changes in culture, value and communication for all of us. That everybody had to work to change, not just call for change. And I think that was a valuable shift in the psyche for the arts in the UK as a whole. Just from one ranty blog that if you read, it's got a lot of swearing in it. And to end, something to think about today, I thought that would be nice. At a conference in Limerick last year, a marketing guru did a wonderful speech about value. She was a very commercial woman. She'd perused sporting and art websites for services available to young people in Ireland and how they were being packaged and marketed. She noticed that sport was great at singing its well-being value from the rooftops, but art was less forthcoming with its direct and clear benefits as part of its sale pitch. She said that she'd been perplexed because often art felt like it was apologising for existing. This lady had dug around in the library in Limerick for statistics and she found out that in Ireland that year, more people had gone to the theatre than to the football. She was astounded that the arts weren't using that stat. And she showed a slide and she said she'd chosen to depict it. She'd chosen it to depict how people in the arts felt about their jobs. The slide said, my muggle friends don't understand what I do which is a Harry Potter reference. Muggles are humans and the witches and wizards are the witches and wizards. And everybody in the room laughed. And I felt really sad. <laughs> um, it struck me that this was something that I could really help change next, that we all could, to change the way we talk about ourselves and our value. For me, my next aim is to get my work and the work of my peers on the television. The same political bent, the same artistic credibility, just a much bigger platform. And what the I'll Show You Mind debate has proved to me is that there's no limits to the power of the artist. So I look forward to talking revolution with you today. Thank you. Thank you.